Hello, everybody, and welcome to the University of Padua channel. I'm Daniele Montodarpizio, and I'm a journalist for Ilbo Live, the online newspaper of the university. Today's topic is artificial intelligence applied to education and training. We'll talk about it with Chris Didi from Harvard University. For decades, a professor in learning technologies, currently Didi is a co-principal investigator at the uh, National Artificial Intelligence Institute in Adult Learning and Online Education. Welcome, Professor Didi. Thank you for being with us. Thank you so much for inviting me to share ideas. The first question is very simple. Could you explain in simple terms what you think about the generative AI? Sure. A little background on my uh, history with AI. When I was a graduate student many decades ago in 1970, I read the first article on AI in education. And that author confidently predicted that we wouldn't need any teachers by the end of the 1970s because AI was going to do all the teaching. And that's illustrative of a lot of the very um, extreme uh, predictions that have been made about AI. I've lived through now about nine hype cycles of AI every five years. And um, the optimists predict that AI is going to take over from human beings. And the pessimists predict that um, evil AI is going to slaughter human beings. And they're never right. And generative AI is, is yet another hype cycle with extreme points of view. But the truth is really somewhere in the middle. So generative AI involves what are called large language models. And it is a breakthrough because since the very beginnings of AI, uh, 75 years ago, um, people have been trying to get AI to understand natural language in the way that human beings speak it. And if you've interacted with a computer, you know that um, in the past, the forms of interaction have been very restricted. You had to write a programming language or you had to uh, choose from one of four options on the screen, or you might be able to say something very simple, um, but not to really have a conversation with a computer. And these large language models are a breakthrough because they can understand and, well, not understand, but they can appropriately respond to human speech. Uh, if, you, if you say something to the large language model, it, it interacts in a way that, that seems as if it understands what you're saying. It doesn't actually, but it, it seems to. And um, this is important because now there's lots of things that we can interact with through language that before we had to use programming languages or some other kind of very restricted interaction. But it comes with a challenge. And the challenge is that it's called the ELISA effect. And basically what it means is that if something uses language, we are wired to assume that it's intelligent. So, you know, when you're an infant, you listen to language and your brain is wired to help interpret and understand that language and develop your ability to, to speak that language. Um, but that means that anything that talks to you, you're going to assume is smart. And in fact, generative AI is not very smart. So people are making all sorts of assumptions about what generative AI can do that are actually based on the ELISA effect. So the best way to think about generative AI is that it's a brain without a mind, that it can listen to language and it can respond to language, but without thinking about it in the way that often people can, can do that very quickly. But it doesn't understand what's being said and it doesn't have some kind of special wisdom. You are, uh, as I said, uh, a co-principal investigator at the National AI Institute on Adult, on adult Learning and Online Education. 
What changes uh, do you predict in the worker upskilling and reskilling? So everyone is talking about AI, but I do a lot of thinking about IA, intelligence augmentation. And this is what happens when a human being and an AI work in partnership and each does what it does well. So as a practical example, many doctors who treat cancer now are beginning to have AI assistance. And the AI can do things that no doctor can do. It can scan uh, 1,500 online medical journals every morning looking for things that might relate to this particular patient and treatment. It can look at online patient records across the world for other people who are being treated for similar conditions and see how, how they're doing. And it can uh, inform the doctor about what it finds. Uh, this is what's called reckoning, calculative prediction, where these AIs can take in enormous amounts of data and very quickly come up with different kinds of patterns and estimates. But the human being is very important, and you would never want the AI treating a patient because the human being understands things the AI does not. What pain is, um, that people have different feelings about death. Some people want quality of life and others want quantity of life. The death affects families that people have. The death is seen in different ways in different cultures and in different spiritual traditions and, and so on. All of those things are really important in helping the patient decide what to do and AI can't do any of them. And this is what's called judgment, practical wisdom. So AI does reckoning and human beings do judgment. And when both are done well and complement one another, then you have IA, intelligence augmentation. So current estimates are that within the next, say, um, 10 years, that most jobs will have AI partners. Most jobs will involve um, IA and that we need to prepare human beings more for judgment and less to do reckoning because the AI is going to do that. So that's the kind of upskilling and reskilling that we think a lot about in this National Institute I'm part of on adult learning and online education. And what about uh, teaching and learning? Is AI going to change uh, university teaching and learning? And how? There's um, several ways in which AI is going to affect university teaching and learning. One of them is that groups like the Institute that I'm part of are developing AI assistance for university faculty members. So IA, uh, is going to affect university faculty. And um, our institute is developing assistance that can answer student questions, that can tutor students on points that um, most of the class might already understand, but some people don't. There are library assistants, there are laboratory assistants, there are social assistants that in a large class can help students find another student who might be a good learning partner. And so you can imagine me as a professor surrounded by these AI agents doing parts of the job that I used to do. Now, if I don't do anything, if I don't upskill, then there isn't any IA. In fact, I'm de-skilled by the AI taking over parts of the job. But if I upskill, if I learn more deeply about my students and I focus more on the cultural dimensions of teaching and the latest ideas that I could be communicating to the students, then there is IA and then the university teaching is improved. So one impact is assistance that aid instruction. A second impact is on learning by doing that um, Students 
increasingly like to learn in things like internet games where they're actually doing something and then they get feedback on how well they're doing it or how poorly they're doing it. Here at Harvard, uh, we are using um, AI agents in a French class and students are practicing their French by being in a simulated environment in Paris where the agents can speak English and can speak French and the students are able to be in an authentic simulation and practice what they're learning. So those are two things that are going to be available to university faculty if they choose to use them. But the really big impact is that we need to prepare students less to do reckoning and more to do judgment. In other words, we're changing the outcomes of education, not just the processes of education. Um, and an, an illustration of this problem is that universities, including Harvard, are basing their, their value on how well students do on high stakes tests of different kinds. But the high stakes tests uh, are all reckoning. AI agents do really well on the high stakes tests. So we're preparing students to lose to AI when we should be emphasizing judgment and preparing students to do better with AI. Um, can generative AI give educators uh, more time to focus on student experience? I think that, that one of the biggest impacts of generative AI, if it's used well, if it's used for intelligence augmentation, is that professors can focus more on the things that human beings do that AI cannot understand. And the cancer specialist that I talked about earlier is an example of this. The cancer specialist can focus more on a particular patient, understanding their family, understanding their culture, personalizing the advice that's given. And the same thing is, is true for students, that students um, are, are nervous because they're graduating into a world of AI. They're not sure what jobs will be available for them. They're not sure what, what skills they're going to need to be employable. And for professors to uh, model um, good use of judgment, uh, the ways that they complement the AIs that they're working with, that can be very powerful in terms of reassuring students that there is a big role for human beings and that there are many things that AI can't do, that in fact, any human being can be smarter than an AI if you use your education well to accomplish this. Professor Didi, do the universities uh, need to change the formative objectives of the, the courses? Educating students on how to use AI is a part of the teacher's role. It is important for the formative objectives of courses to change so that students are well prepared for a world of AI. But this doesn't mean that the students need a lot of technical knowledge of AI. Uh, you can drive a car without understanding the internal combustion engine that drives the car or how the transmission works or how the brakes work. But Uh, what you do need to do to drive a car is to know how to use all those things well in the real world. And the same thing is true with AI, that students need to understand its strengths and its limits, but not necessarily how it works. Mainly, they need to understand that learning In learning, the destination is not the end of the journey. The destination is the journey itself. So if you're learning to write, we ask students to produce essays, or if you're in marketing, to produce a marketing plan, or if you're in computer science, to produce a program, or if you're in art, to produce a painting, 
But those are proxies, those destinations, those outcomes are proxies for a journey that a student takes to learn how to take their own thoughts and turn them into writing that's interesting and and compelling for other people to create a painting that that other people resonate with and so on. And what happens when students use generative AI to produce those proxies, to write the essay, to do the painting and so on, is that they're not taking the journey and so they're not learning how to get to the destination. And even though they're producing the proxy, they're cheating themselves. Um, in interviews now for jobs, um, people are being asked to do something. My daughter graduated in engineering. She was asked to debug uh, a machine. Uh, other people go in and business and they're asked to do a marketing plan. But then after you do that, the interviewer is going to ask generative AI to do the same thing. And if you're not better, a lot better than what generative AI can do, you're not going to get the job because why would you pay somebody to get something that you can get for free? So that's um, the big change in the formative objectives is saying AI is the floor and we can teach you how to get above the floor and to be someone who people will gladly hire because you're so much better than generative AI. But in order to do that, you have to take the journey yourself. You can't use generative AI to take the journey for you. Professor Didi, uh, our uh, last question. What advice would you give a professor in leadership in higher, in higher education institution? I would be skeptical and I would go slowly with generative AI. Many claims are being made about generative AI that are simply not true. Its major strengths is that it can respond to language, but because of the ELISA effect, we tend to think that it actually understands language, that it has some kind of special wisdom, that if we ask it something, we'll get a better answer than we'll get if we talk to a human being and so on. Those things are not true. And so being skeptical, going slow, understanding the limits of generative AI are really important. But what is important to think about for professors and leadership is to say, measuring how well our students do on high stakes summative tests is now the wrong measure because AI can do well on summative high stakes tests. We need to give students tasks, destinations that AI cannot easily reach that involve human judgment. And then students will be well prepared for this world of intelligence augmentation. Thank you, Professor Didi. I'm deeply honored. Well, thank you for asking me to share ideas, and I'm I'm happy. Um, I'm I hope that uh, there's a lot of interest in in this, and uh, I have written some material on the subject. And so, if people want to know more, they're welcome to do an internet search and find some of the things that I've written that might be helpful. Greetings from Padua. Thank you.